we are on page 83, uh, lesson 13, and uh, we'll see how far we get tonight. I got uh, several things to talk about tonight, and I've got the books for the next class. Um, we um, and we've got um, another week yet, and then the next week after that is Holy Week when we have. Um, the uh, Passover supper on Wednesday night. So we won't meet that night. Um, and then, so this week and next week, we'll definitely either be on this or be looking at some slides. And then we're gonna have six more weeks after that. So, I mean, I, I hate starting really book one uh, kind of in the middle of the year, but I don't know what else to do about that. Um, I tell people all the time, you can jump in anywhere you want, doesn't matter. And then just rotate till you get back to where you started. Um, or go through it twice. A lot of people went through it twice. I mean, quite a few actually went through it twice. And so, um, and then we'll, um, and tonight, tonight we're talking about church history, really, as we are on page 83. We uh, were kind of to this point um, where we are literally, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul's ministry and stuff here at the beginning, but for the most part, we are out of biblical history. We're outside of that, talking about what happened at the end of the New Testament all the way up to, to today. And so um, it says in this lesson, we conclude our study of the church by doing an overview of what happened in the church in the 2000 year period since the end of the New Testament. We finished the last three letters of the acrostic report and understand better where the church is today and why it is what it is. And so. Um, let me just, under re, the word review, let me remind you of what the word report stands for. When we get to the Old Testament, um, in, in book one, we're going to talk about the word stages. It stands for starting treaties and tribes, advancement, glory, erosion, and servitude. And those that covers the whole Old Testament. And if you can remember, and then there's events in each one of them, um, just like there is in the word report. Um, so the R stands for Redeemer. And back when we were talking about Redeemer, we were talking about Christ and uh, the events that happened there. So the R stands for Redeemer. The E stands for the early church and the events that happened uh, in the early church. Um, so, I mean, the Redeemer stage, actually, I mean, you know this, but it's it's about four to about 30 B.C., somewhere in there, two 2 BC, 4 BC to about 29 to 30 BC, 31 BC, uh, depending on, on whose uh, calendar you look at. It, it would have been nice if Jesus would have been born exactly on zero, you know, but that Gregorian monk that made the calendar was off three or four or five years. And so, um, or maybe a year, I, I'm not really, nobody knows for sure, I don't think. Um, but uh, we, we can kind of guesstimate by, and the Old Testament date of when um, the King Cyrus made the decree for the Jew Jews to return back to Jerusalem. And that was in 445 BC. And when we get into book one, uh, we'll be talking about that at some point. And you'll understand why I believe there's a certain date that Jesus came into Jerusalem. And that'll make more sense then. But Redeemer is just a pretty short period of time. The early church was a short period of time as well. The P stands for Paul's ministry. Um, and, you know, as you go back through your, if you go back through your lessons, you know that Paul's ministry, you know, stood for different things. And we're going to talk about all of this here in a minute. Okay. Uh, starting with the early church. Um, one church, we're going to talk about that a good bit tonight. Um, the O stands for one church. Just remember that until 1500, there was one church. <laughs> it was called the Catholic Church, which means universal church is what it means. It, the word Catholic meant a whole different thing back then than it does today. Uh, um, but there wasn't all kinds of denominations or anything like that. It was basically controlled by one church. Um, the R stands for Reformation. That uh, happens in about 1500 when Martin Luther... Uh, nails the 95 thesis on the 
Castle Door in Wurttemberg, Germany. Um, it's a church castle door, by the way. Um, and then the T stands for today. And today can be a fairly, um, that doesn't mean 2024. Um, it means very much the uh, the modern time or, or what's happened in history up to this point. Um, so let's first talk about Redeemer. It's right there at the bottom of your page, and it says 4 BC to 33, but like I said, that that's uh, questionable. Um, the first thing is a perfect life, and, it, and the blank there is it qualifies him as the perfect sacrifice. Um, this is so true. I mean, you can't ever teach this enough, in my opinion. I mean, I have mentioned this literally hundreds upon hundreds of times from the pulpit. And uh, in classes, sin required a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus Christ uh, was perfect, absolutely perfect, his entire life. He never made one single mistake. Um, there's people that are like that today. We call them narcissists. And, uh, <laughs> but he was perfect. I mean, he never made a single mistake. And that was the only thing that was going to satisfy the wrath of God to pay for sin. You know, animals would never do that. We're going to, we'll actually talk just a, a minute about that on Sunday, this Sunday, but um, it qualifies him as a perfect sacrifice. And uh, that Hebrews 4, 15 passage says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but we have had one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And I, I think, I think it goes without saying that if there's ever been any person alive on the planet that's ever been tempted, it would have been Jesus. Because if Satan could have took him down, it would have stopped everything. You know, if Satan took Peter down, he could have damaged the apostles and the church. But if he could have took Christ down, <laughs> that's taken God down. And I'm sure Satan tempted him in every possible way imaginable. Um, so he is the perfect high priest. Secondly, he's a sacrificial death, which qualifies his sacrificial death, qualifies me for salvation. Since he died, it qualifies me for salvation. For by one sacrifice, he was made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. And uh, without his perfect sacrifice, obviously, we could never be saved because somebody's got to pay for sin. And uh, we are all going to pay for our own sin unless we accept Christ. Um, and I don't think people understand the magnitude of how, how, how damning sin is. It is. It's, it's so damning that people that don't accept Christ and accept his sacrifice for their sin pay for their sin forever. It never, ever ends. And salvation is so wonderful that it's forever and you can never praise God enough. So the the infinity or the extent of those two are uh, are something that I don't think people understand the seriousness of. I mean, God died literally so that people would live and people that don't accept that will pay for it forever. And people that do will be blessed forever. Uh, it's really a big deal. And so um, that sacrificial death is really important. And then the third one is a resurrection qualifies him as God. First Peter says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth and the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He he had to rise from the dead, right? I mean, the, the, his death paid for sin. But if he didn't rise from the dead, then it wouldn't he wouldn't have been God. And so that had to happen. And of course, it was going to happen and did happen. But it it shows that he is God. Um, you don't raise yourself from the dead. God, God does that. Any thoughts? Okay, Redeemer. The E stands for early church. 
And uh, the early church, um, typically we ended about 50 AD, somewhere in there. Um, and Acts 1 and 2, we see that Pentecost uh, in Acts 1 and 2 empowers a believer for faithfulness and ministry. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit uh, coming into your life. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues and other tongues as God enabled them. Um, and, and obviously, we've talked about that, that this was a known language, and it was a way of spreading the gospel to multiple groups of people with different nationalities, um, different languages. Um, the uh, I think the language barrier in Jerusalem at that time would have been almost unbelievable. You know, you go to you go to countries today where there's you know this ethnic melting pot of people um, coming in. I, I read here a few years ago that the the high schools in Los Angeles um, and Los Angeles is a big city. It's like 150 miles across Los Angeles, um, and there's there's about 150 different languages taught in the high schools in Los Angeles, and so it's like all these different people, you know, it's just hard to imagine. But when the Holy Spirit came, you know, to to give evidence that this was of God, you know, people began to speak in these these tongues and they they did ministry. You know, it, it, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Um, and secondly, is the organization. There were there were three events that we talked about in the early church. Um, and Acts 2 to 6 instructs the church on structure and focus. I mean, it's brand new. They've got to get organized. Um, and they're trying to figure it out, you know, as God leads them. And so they definitely devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is always a, the primary thing for churches, and to the fellowship with each other and to the breaking of bread and prayer. So you got those four elements to that. But it definitely, it sets the focus and the structure for all future churches, really. And then persecution is the third. In Acts 7 and 9, it spread the church throughout the empire. I mean, without persecution, everybody would have hung around, right? <laughs> they, need, they needed to go, you know? Um, and, and, the, and so it, it, it spread the church throughout the empire. It solidified the faith of the followers. And it exposed the imposters. That's what persecution does. I mean... Persecution, without question, separates the believers from the unbelievers. I mean, if you're a true believer of Christ, you will still believe in Christ, even though you're being persecuted. And, um, and that, you know, people can be put in very, very uh, life-threatening and even killed for their faith. But countless people have been murdered for their faith over the years. You know, I remember when... when uh, when I was in Sierra Leone, the war started. That that country was at peace for 150 years, all right? I got there two months after I got there, the war broke out. It's like, seriously, God, out of 150 years now, you know, come on, <laughs> two months. And then uh, a year later, we got robbed and, and, you know, lots of stuff happened during that time. But when the when the rebels came in, they would go to go into a city and line all the guys up. And go to the first one and say, you going to join us? And he'd say, nope. <laughs> Shut him in the head. Ask the next one, you going to join us? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then they would shoot him up with drugs. And they were drugged about half the time. And uh, they used them as their frontline soldiers in case somebody shot. You know, they would be the ones to get hit first. And, uh, you know, you, you think about what people have had to go through. But there's been a lot of people murdered for the cause of Christ. and. Uh, what persecution does, without question, it 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 solidifies that faith. You know who has faith, and you know who the imposters are. Um, and uh, hopefully, God will never let us have to go through that that level of persecution. But any thoughts on any of that? Is your husband going to help you fulfill your dream job? I, I have to. Oh. 
Do you have what? Cat mom. Oh, cat mom. I didn't see the cat. I didn't see it. I just saw. I just saw mom. Okay. Sorry, I brought her up. <laughs> and you got nothing to do with your kids, right? No. no. Yeah, this is true. They're older. <laughs> but, you know, I get the summer oh. with them. That's it. Yeah. What's that? You need one of those birds. No. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't love any animal. No. I like the ones on my plate. Them are the ones I like. <laughs> They're good with a little steak sauce or barbecue, you know. <laughs> Whatever it takes, man, you know. Um, Paul's ministry, uh, we talked about that. That's basically from around 50 to 70, um, 48 to 67, but in that, that time frame there somewhere. And three parts to that, he's the persecutor. Um, and, and basically, you know, I don't really have anything for you to write down here. Um, he, that's what he did. He was a persecutor. He persecuted Christians. He arrested men and women, put them in jail. He was there and gave his approval when they were stoned and when they were killed. Um, how interesting that, you know, later in his life, he'd get his head cut off because he was a Christian. Uh, full circle. So he was definitely a persecutor. Um, he says there in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Yeah, I imagine that was always something that haunted him his whole life, you know. Um, but God had definitely called him, and he he was a persecutor. And then secondly, he was a pastor preacher, um, and that's how God led him. Um, he was called Saul, but became Paul, and he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. In fact, people were astonished that this man who had been a persecutor was now preaching about Christ. And then he was also a prisoner. Um, we know about that. He was a prisoner for Christ and God had let him go through an awful lot um, to, to further the kingdom, you know, and uh, that happens. Sometimes people endure a lot. Um, they love the Lord but they still have a lot of problems to deal with and it's God doing something. I mean, we don't always know the end story, but somebody just told me that in the last 24 hours that they said that God is um, doing something with what they, they're having to deal with. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but they trust God enough to know that what they're going through is uh, building character and is going to be used by him in some way or another. So any thoughts on Paul's ministry? Okay, one church. Here's where we get into the fun part, all right? We can go a lot of ways with this. Um, it's uh, There's a, an awful lot to talk about this, and there are several pages here to go over. Um, if we're lucky, we won't get done tonight. So we can spend some more time on it next week. Um, there's just so much to this. I mean, I remember back when I studied history of Christianity in uh, in college, I had to read two 900 page books um, written by Kenneth Scott Labrat. And uh, wow, I never I'd read a comic book one time when I was younger. But I mean, this was like serious business to go to college and have to read. I mean, I had, to, I had to get glasses then. I never, I've read a stop sign before. You know, I I, I literally read nothing. And um, this, to, to go over what we're going to go over in this week and maybe a little next week is just an incredible amount of time, 1,500 years almost. Um, and so much has happened in that time. And I, I found out over the years that most people are pretty oblivious really to what happened to Christianity during that time. And they're confused about the Crusades, maybe don't even know when they happened, why they had the Crusades, um, all of the the dealings with the Catholic Church and the corruption of the Catholic Church and when Protestant denominations started, you know, when Protestantism started. And 
and how all that took place. So feel free to ask questions. I may not have the answer, but you know, we can maybe find the answer together. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff that happened. And actually I've got a book here. This is called, uh, this, our book here, book four that we're going through ends with talking very little about. So what I did years ago was I made this book. It's called the history of Christianity, birth to present, not really a book. It's just a little paper and what it, and if you want a copy of this, I'll lay it out or pass it around and you can look at it. And the front of it says history of Christianity, other events and dates. And I, when I built, when I made this thing, I made this like over 20 years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago. And when I did this, I kind of wanted to do it for my own well-being so that I knew what events happened and I could actually have, use it as a reference to look up. And so the very beginning of it, it starts with one church to 1500 AD. Uh, but, but then there's the, the next section too. And what I did was I went through and I started and I kind of outlined like what happened between zero and 100. And then I listed all of the things that happened in that 100 year period of time. And then 100 to 200. And then I listed all the things that happened during that time. Um, when certain people were alive, when the books were written, like like uh, in 80 AD, the Colosseum in Rome was built. And it was built in seven years. And I have that date in here. Uh, Nero commits suicide in 68. Uh, Hebrews is written about 64 to 68. And then you go on a little bit further, um, like 197 AD was when the Apostles' Creed was written. Um, and then 200 to 300, um, and different people like Tertullian, um, different um, men of the Old Testament, when some of the emperors were lived. Um, in 314 AD, Constantine ordered the cross to be put on coins because he switched, the Roman world switched to Christianity at that point. Um, not really... Uh, true Christianity to some degree. I mean, he wanted all of his soldiers to be baptized, so he just marched them through the river. So, you know, it's like you do what you, you need to do, I guess. Um, this has the Nicene Creed in it. It has um, it, it has information in it about when the first Bibles were written. Like there's a couple really old versions of the New Testament called the Codex uh, Venacticus and the Codex Synacticus. Um, and... Uh, Actually, I have a picture here of a page of the Codex uh, Venaticus, ben, and it's about 340 AD, um, and it's an early, early Christian Bible. Um, and then, just to give you a little more information, it goes like goes through the years. I I have like earthquakes in it, like there was an earthquake in Antioch, in the city of Antioch, in 526 AD, killed 250,000 people. I mean, there's all kinds of events, and 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 uh, what I what I w wanted with this is for if anybody got a hold of this was to say, yeah, Christianity is right in the history of other events, you know, that we we have. Um, so, like I told you before, that um, um, Cleopatra. Anthony and Cleopatra. Cleopatra talked to Anthony and then moving the library from Ephesus to the library in Alexandria. Um, I got a note here that uh, the uh, the uh, library of Alexandria in 640 AD burned and with it 300,000 ancient papyrus scrolls were destroyed. A huge loss. Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine if we had all those scrolls today? What that value of that and then you get to a page where the Reformation begins, and then it's 1500 to 47, 1947. And that's because in 48 when Israel got their land back. And so, and then on page um, 14, I have Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. All 95 of them are written in here. So you can see what he wrote um, um, and what he was, what he spoke. Um, about, I've got some of them highlighted, um, but the, the ones that are um, of a great importance. And then, so that's like four or five pages. And then on page 
um, 20, 21, and 22, and 3 is a list of all the popes. So if you want to know who the pope was at what particular time, um, that's a, a list. And then um, it it goes up to, and I think the last entry in here is 2021, when Mount Olivet moved the second service into the family life center. So that, that was in October of 21. So I haven't updated it since then. But you can look at this. If you want a copy, I will I'll print that out. And uh, it's just a good reference point to look back and see when certain things happen and when world events happen. And people, when people were alive and uh, things like that, because Christianity is a part of world history. I mean, it very much is. Um, the world wants to tell us it's not, but but it is. And so there's a lot that can be learned from that. So just let me know if you want one of them and I'll, I'll make some copies. Um, so let's look at page 85 then. Um, 85, uh, we start out the top of the page with one church, and it says, During this period, Christians were persecuted, most notably by Nero, Domitian, and Diocletian. Um, it's also the time, this time, that the church is facing persecution from within, from the threat of the cults. And there are four main cults that threaten the church. And... Uh, I don't know how interested you are in these. I think that at least the first one is important um, because um, what happens, um, the church, it, during this time of all this all this stuff's going on, there's kind of a, it, I don't know if I want to call it a migration, but there's kind of this thought that everything kind of is led by what happens in Rome. I think when, when Christianity first started, um, there were, you know, there were large churches in different places, but it kind of seems like, you know, at one particular time in, in particular that, uh, especially during the, all the persecution and everything, and as the church spread more and more rapidly, um, um, and even, even Tertullian wrote one time that the, the spread of the church, um, was that the, the death of martyrs was kind of like the seeds that spread the church, you know, that when people died for their faith, that was really uh, very impactful um, in the spread of Christianity um, because the true believers, um, um, they faced that persecution and they faced the threat of cults. And uh, those cults um, very much were uh, alive. Um, Gnosticism was was one of the cults, um, and Gnosticism um, is a um, it, it's a it basically means that salvation is by knowledge. Um, Gnost is um, and what it kind of means, and, and it's and its root is know. So you, it's it's what you know, and um, one of the things about the, the Catholic Church, and we'll talk about this again in a little bit, but uh, or next week, but here in a little bit, we should be reaching that far. Um, the uh, the Catholics believe in in what's called papal succession, and that the Pope is the the papal the Pope. Um, they believe that that what you know is passed down, and so Peter was the first Pope. He had information that he passed to the second Pope and that knowing what they knew, knowing that this information along with the fact that they were appointed by God, appointed through the, uh, the structure and uh, organization of the Catholic church that the next Pope is then appointed, you know, um, and that that knowledge that was passed down was extremely important. And so 
what Gnosticism says is that it's what you know, um, it's what you know that brings you salvation. So what they're saying is the doctrine of salvation is by knowledge. Uh, it's by knowledge. It's not. Um, it's not by anything in the material world. Um, and and literally, the other thing you could say about Gnosticism, um, they don't believe they they don't believe that you're saved by faith. It's not by faith. And that was very real in the uh, church, um, very much so. Um, that is true today. I would say that probably out of all the cults in the world today, that Gnosticism is probably one of the, and there's all different, I mean, Gnosticism is just not like, it's not like cut and dry Christianity and we have the Bible, this is what we believe and so on. Gnosticism has many different forms and levels. Um, in fact, it can be, one can be so much different from the other that you don't think they're even both Gnostic. Um, but Gnosticism is is very prevalent today and in, in, in a way where people think they, what they know saves them. As, well, um, I, it could be, I don't know a lot about Scientology. I know it's a cult. It's not, it's, it's a, it's a false religion. Um, but what, what I'm referring to is there's people in the church today that think that because they know something, um, and, and this is how they do it. They say, I know that when I was 16 or when I was 25 or whenever that I went up front and I prayed and I accepted Jesus into my heart. I know I'm saved because I did that. No, you don't. You know you're saved because of how you live today. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you love his word? Are you active in ministry? I mean, it is, is Christ the highest priority in your life? Is it reflected in what you do, what you give? I mean, it's faith in action, like James says. If there's no action tied to your faith, you're dead. There's a whole lot of people that go to church on Sunday, go home. They know they're saved. But they're not. I mean, I, you can say you love somebody. But if you don't ever do anything about it, it's it's just hollow words. But I think that I think the knowledge of the Gnostic belief that what you know um, is uh, so used by Satan, it's it's the very high level of um, deception. And in my mind, the, the, a lot of the way Gnosticism works is it's by what you uh, you do. You earn your way to heaven, you know. Um, and it, that that takes it to its farthest extreme. But uh, it's definitely something that came into the church. They, they believed in more spiritual type stuff. And basically Gnosticism, too, is it, it kind of separates uh, the material world. And uh, we'll see that it shows up a little bit more in some other other beliefs here too. And another uh, belief is um, it's called the asceticism. Um, the asceticism um, basically is a, a heresy that what what it said was Christ had um, he didn't have a real body. He just appeared to have a real body. And because he didn't really have a real body, he didn't suffer like they say he did. This belief is strong in the fact that um, all matter is evil. Anything physical is evil. Anything spiritual is godly, but anything that's physical is evil. So, therefore, Christ could not have a real body. If he did, he could not be God because God would never, never be physical or never be 
a person in the flesh. Uh, flesh is evil, and they would say that would that would never never be the case. Um, the third third one um, is um, I O N I S D. Um, Ebionism is uh, is a theological view that Jesus was not God, but really just a man, and God adopted him because he was so good. Um, and he called him the son of God, even, because he was so good. And you might think that, how in the world can anybody possibly think that? The false religions of the world are full of this kind of belief, all kinds of belief. Like the uh, the Hindu religion has millions of gods, millions of gods. A lot of religions believe you can become a god. Um, and it's just amazing what people believe. Another another type. Um, is Montanism. Uh, it didn't start in Montana, actually, but um, it's a it's it's basically kind of like a, a prophetic movement in a way. Um, it it's um this this one's kind of hard to explain, but it's it's um it didn't start really till the second century, but basically what it called for was just rely on the Holy Spirit. And um, and it had a very personal uh, ethic to it, um, a very conservative personal ethic to it. That that um, that you just whatever whatever you think the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, you just do it. You'll be good. I think, but it's very spontaneous in, in the way it, uh, you would do it. Uh, the next blank on your page is basically. It, it's because of the cults that the church theology was defined. And I don't think that could be stated strong enough. When you've got people, if okay, let's say you've got all these people out here, just thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and they're all saying, this is Christianity, this is Christianity, this is Christianity. And down here, you got the, the true people that are truly Christians who, it makes us say, we're going to define Christianity so that we know people know it's true. We're going to um, not really like make laws, but we're going to say, here's the basics of Christianity. And that makes things happen over time. You know, at a certain time, uh, they came up with the Apostles' Creed because of this kind of stuff. Because when you have heresies happening, then what the true church has to do is they have to define what they believe and write it down so that anything that doesn't align with that belief um, is, is proven invalid. Like today, for example, we were just talking about people working their way to heaven. And that is, that is absolutely, Christianity is loaded with people. I would say the vast majority of Christians in the world today think that they they could work their way to heaven, um, in one way or the other. Or you did something, or you went to the altar when you were a kid, or you prayed this prayer, or whatever. There's that you know, there's something you did that you can work your way to heaven. But the Bible, and we all know the Bible is very clear about the fact that it's a gift. It's free. You put your faith in Jesus. It's there's no working away. You can't do a single thing ever to get any closer to heaven or get yourself into heaven. You can't do that. It's 100% the sacrifice of Jesus, 100% his gift, without question. We all know that. But yet Christianity is full of people that say, yeah, you can work your way to heaven. So what we have to do is have in our theology or what our denomination or what our church stand for, we have to put in the bylaws or put in our church discipline is what the United Brethren call it. Our church discipline is the book, rule booklet that shows the basics of what we believe and why we believe it. 
and uh, spell it out. Yeah, and that's what heresies do. They make you define who you are. And as time went on and uh, the Reformation started, then years after that, you got people saying, no, when you get baptized. And, and Denny Miller wrote this book. Maybe I told you before. He was telling me one time about some guy that left his church and came to his church because when they baptized, they only dumped him one time. And he said, you can't do that. You have to baptize him with the Father, take him under a second time with the Son, take him under a third time with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, I looked at him and said, you left your church because of that? And the guy goes, yeah, that's not the way you do it. You have to bat dunk him three times. And it's like, how do you, where do you get your reference at? I mean, it's not in scripture, you know? I mean, and so people, so what you have to do then is say, well, in our church, we believe in immersion, and here's why. Um, you know, we had a family leave Mount Oliver here about three years ago because it came time for their baby to be dedicated, and they wanted their baby to be baptized. And I said, I won't do it. Because in the scripture, only people that are baptized are people that make a decision for Christ. You can't make a decision for Christ when you're a baby. But they, the husband had grown up in the faith where you, bat, like the Catholics, you baptize them and even believe that if you don't baptize them after they're born, they die, they'll go to hell. And so the wife didn't believe that at all, but she had to do what her husband wanted. But that's, that's sad. But you, you have to define what you believe. And that's what heresy does. It forces you to decide this is what we believe. Here's why we believe it. And that sets us apart from heresy. Because you read the Apostles' Creed, we believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, suffered and died, rose again on the third day, you know, we, and born of a virgin. All of the, the basics of what we would say is non-negotiable, you know, non-negotiable stuff. And, and I think what happens in Christianity for a long time, and it hap happens all the time, is the fact that people will fight over stuff that is negotiable. You know, and oftentimes it's so ridiculous. It's the color of the room or the color of the carpet or what music is played or just stupid things. You know, I mean, if you're going to fight over something, fight over something we're fighting for. I mean, if you're going to draw a line in the sand. Be prepared to do battle over the things that matter, you know, not what doesn't matter. I don't care how many times you dump somebody and dump them 10 if you want. You know, I'm going to do once. I'm good with that, you know, <laughs> and if you don't like it, there's another church down the road that might do it two, three times, you know, but you got to, you got to stand up for what, for what you believe and, and, uh, and define it. So does that make sense? Because all of the heresies in the church, that's what has made the church define itself more and more and more. And in today's world, we have the Calvin versus the Arminian, you know, the Calvins believe that you can't ever lose your salvation or the five point Calvinists do. Whereas the Arminian belief says, yeah, you can lose your salvation, which I don't believe at all. But our denomination, the United Brethren, is primary, primarily Arminian. That's the background we came from. And there's pastors in our churches that believe you can lose your salvation. They're wrong. <laughs> I can prove them they're wrong. <laughs> but I'm not going to fight for it. It's not worth fighting for. Because I think um, I think that, uh, you know, if they want to fight about something, they say that Christ wasn't born of a virgin or he wasn't sinless or he wasn't in the flesh. Yeah, that stuff will fight over. But make sense? So, and it's just sad that there's so many denominations, really, because you know, like the Apostles' Creed, you have it on the bottom of your page there. Um, tell you what, Lord, would you read that for us? The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Okay, that's 
that's the stuff we're fighting for, right? And uh, when it says the Holy Catholic Church, it's basically meaning the universal church or the way to think of it is the church. I mean, Christ created the church. So um, that's that's in the scripture and it's it's all of that is um is important any thoughts about any of that um let me i got that written down here somewhere down um it was not the apostles creed was written um The Apostles' Creed was written in 197, so the the apostles were quite cold by then, right? You know, they've been dead a long time. <laughs> but I I think maybe the reference to that is um, the fact that the this is what the apostles taught and believed, you know, and maybe it gives it a little bit more weight. Um, Now, I had asked about us doing it in front of everybody at the church, but the reason I got it and um, found out apparently there's another version of it based on the wording. Is there any big difference between? Yeah. Um, I would like to take the whole Catholic Church out of it just because of what the Catholic Church stands for today. I don't, I don't want to be associated with Catholic Church in any way, shape, or form, but it does mean universal. I think there is a version that says, I believe in Christ's church which might be a better rendering for my mind anyway. Um, I haven't really looked into that word, I don't know. I was just asking because I wanted to be proper with putting it up as part of the church and putting it in service. I wanted to make sure that Nash were a denomination belief, and then we were struggling with that too, where it wasn't a denomination for us to teach. Mm -hmm. The creed. Because mm -hmm. I had heard it, but I, I don't remember much of it. I don't think I was really taught it, but I heard Memphis, so. It should, it should be in the Methodist Church, too, really. Do what? I remember when I was still doing it. That was a year ago. I don't know what you meant at all. Because I was saying it was too sweet. Yeah. 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 I think they believe in all of that. They just believe in a lot of stuff that's not true. And I, and I think, you know, the last Vatican Council was like 1962 when a Vatican, I think it was called the Vatican II, um, was, was written. Actually, I think I got a picture because it was hate. It was held in. Um, huh? <laughs> yeah. There's a picture of it, actually, and it's held in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and uh, I've been in that that church before. It's absolutely massive, but it it 19 yeah 1962. It's called the Second Vatican Council. Um, it was the 21st Ecumenical Council, um, and um, it. Uh, it lasted between each session. There were four periods or sessions, each one lasting eight to 12 weeks. Um, and uh, they did it from 62 to 65, and they produced 16 documents that became official after the approval of the Pope. Um, but they re, you know, at that particular time, um, they, they, um, how do I say it? They uh, reconfirmed some of their beliefs, like they re reconfirmed the fact that they still believe in purgatory. You can still buy your way out of hell. Um, and just all that kind of stuff is just so ridiculous. You can pray to the saints. I mean, there's not a saint that's ever died that listens to prayers today. God listens to prayers. Mary doesn't hear prayers. You know, and that there's just so many things that are not true 
Um, and so, and not um, in agreement with scripture, but they don't believe that scripture is the only authority. That's where the issue exists. The Catholics believe in three equal forms of authority. One is the tradition of the church. So the church, the true church is the Catholic church. They're the true church. They have the authority. They've had papal succession. They've got the Pope. Uh, the second thing they believe in is, is the Bible, but they have five more books than we do, um, which those five are not uh, canonical. They're not authoritative. Um, and then they also believe that when the Pope speaks what they call ex cathedra, those words are equal to scripture because God's given them. So those are their three forms of authority, which is um, causes a lot of problems because there's been a lot of popes over the years that <laughs> have said things. And when they say them, then that's a part of the Catholic law that goes into effect. And a new pope coming in can't say the old pope was wrong because then that takes away the authority of his words. So um, a lot of errors. No. Oh, man. You read some. One of them got pregnant. Yeah. Seriously. One of them hated the pope before him so much. He had his body exhumed, put in the judgment chair, condemned him to hell, and reburied. I mean, that, there's all kinds of stuff that happened in the Catholic Church. It, it was quite evil for a long period of time. I think there are people within the Catholic Church that are trying to do the right thing. I think they have been, they've grown up with this ingrained uh doctrine that the catholic church is a true church that the pope does have the authority that the bible is god's word and you know i i i know monks and i know nuns that have given their life for the cause of christ they fall under the submission of the catholic church and i think i think some of them are saved i think they love jesus they love his word they've given their lives they serve um the evidences and what they've done and their commitment to Christ, their love for his word, their love for people. Um, but I think it's, it, it concerns me that, um, that they don't understand that the scripture is the only authority. And that's what, that's one of the things that Martin Luther did. Um, was the fact that he he said that it's scripture alone is the authority. It's called uh, sola scripture. I mean, it, scriptoria in Latin, but it's, and then sola fide, which means only by faith. You aren't saved by works, you're saved only by faith. And the scripture is the only authority. And when he said that, that's one of the reasons why he was excommunicated is because that is saying, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he's, it's not the same as the Bible. Or the Catholic Church is not, their tradition is not equal with the Bible. So, I mean, it's, and they consider that a heresy. And uh, about that time, a lot of other people came to the surface too. So, anyway, any other thoughts? Okay, page 86. Um, I have several things for you to write down under under these men. Um, some of these maybe you've not heard of before, but they have all had, uh, um, and they're called church fathers, early church fathers. Um, and there's a lot that could be said about them. Let me just give you the date. Um, Clement. I, I don't know when he was born, but he died about 99. He he died at, uh, about the same time as the Apostle John. But this is Pope Clement the First. Okay, that's who this is, Pope Clement the First. Uh, he's also known in the in the Roman Catholic Church as Saint Clement. Um, 
and he is he was a bishop of Rome, by the way. Um, and he held office. He got elected to pope in ninety two at age ninety two, and he was there to about age ninety nine. So he was born about zero. Um, And there's a lot of a lot of his writings. Uh, Polycarp is. Have any of you ever heard of Polycarp before? Polycarp is definitely one of the most um, loved church fathers. Um, him and well, all of these guys are. I mean, I've I've seen these guys' names hundreds of times, literally in writings. Um, but Polycarp was he was a second century Christian. He lived from about 69 to about 155. The year 69 to 155. Um, he was the bishop of a place called Smyrna. S-M-Y-R-N-A. Um, he died as a martyr. And uh, history tells us that he was uh, bound and burned at the stake. But they couldn't get the fire hot enough to kill him, so they stabbed him. Um, Polycarp was, um, yeah, <laughs> He didn't win either way, did he? The, one of the reasons why, and Polycarp wrote a lot of stuff. All of these guys, there's there's writings that exist from these church fathers. Um, and, and one of the interesting things about the church fathers, too, is that, and maybe you've heard me say this before, but there are today in the world, there are about 25,000 ancient manuscripts of the Bible. Some of them are small fragments. Some of them are like the book of Isaiah, which is 24 feet long and 11 inches high, and it's all in one big scroll that they found in the Quorum Caves um, in 1948. Um, all of them, all of, all of the church fathers have written letters. And this is one of the, one. Of, this is just so cool, I think it's cool. You might not find it cool, but I do. And so you'll, you, you gotta love it too. Since I love it, you gotta love it, right? <laughs> Um, they have taken all of the church fathers, which is many more guys than this. They've put their writings in the computers and looked for biblical quotes, um, verses that they put in letters when they wrote, when they encouraged each other. Sometimes some of the letters has a lot of scripture in it. And all of the historical early church fathers, all of their letters, when they combine them all together and put them in the computer, it has the entire New Testament in those letters. Isn't that cool? And this, to me, this is like God saying, here's another verification that these 26 books are the authoritative books of scripture. Isn't that cool? So, I mean, and we can only do that within the last 20 years. You know, put all them in a computer and get them verified. So that's pretty cool. Polycarp, another thing you could write down about Polycarp, one the most interesting thing about Polycarp was he was a student of the Apostle John. So this guy had eyewitness an account. He talked to the Apostle John. And so he is he's known for that. Um, Justin Martyr is the uh, next guy. Uh, he was alive from about 100 to about 165. Um, He's known as St. Justin. He, he's known as an early uh, Christian, what's called an apologist. Uh, O-P-O-L-O-G-I-S-T, an apologist, which is basically means defending the faith. He would write things to, to defend the faith against heresy and that sort of thing. Um, and he is one of the early writers that... Uh, wrote about the logos which is the means the word and then in the greek new testament when you talk about scripture or the word in greek it's uh the word logos which is which means god's word um and he was a writer about that and was very influential in the in the development and and you got to remember these these guys these first few guys are really while the church is being formed you know, and the New Testament's getting put together, you know, and, and all that. Um, Arrhenius, 
is he lived from about 130 to about 202. Um, he's also called St. Arrhenius. Um, he was a bishop in a, in a town in the country of Gaul, G-A-U-L, um, which is in Europe. Um, it, it, it also actually was, um, became a part of the Roman Empire as well. Um, I can't remember which one of the Herods um, defeated the, the people of Gaul, but that, it was a, a very difficult for Rome to uh, conquer Gaul, but they, they did. He was a, a bishop in, a, in, in Gaul. Um, he also was an apologist. Um, and Arrhenius is uh, very well known for being one of the guys that was very, um, very key to forming Christian theology. Like, you know, we have our theological stand and we get it all from scripture, but um, we're, you know, we, we write it out so that we show people what, what we believe. And so he was a very much important part of when the early church was forming its doctrines, when they were saying, no, Jesus was in the flesh, you know, and they got examples from scripture and said, you know, this is what we believe. We're not changing the view on this. This is what we believe. And so these guys were all a part of that, uh, like what I talked about there, the, the development of, of the uh, what's called the canon or the or the Bible. Origin. Um, he lived from about 184 to about 253. And this guy was, he was a very prolific writer. This guy wrote a lot. And uh, he wrote on multiple different, um, what would you say, um, like branches of theology. Theology is broken down into multiple parts. Um and I mean, like the United Brethren theology books like that thing. Um, and he wrote about a lot of different things. So he was very important. Um, he, he um, some of the things he was known for was uh, a biblical exegesis. Um, and basically that's exegesis. It's spelled E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. And biblical exegesis is basically how I preach, for the most part. I take a passage of scripture and I, I exegete it. I, I take it apart. I find scripture that back it up, and everything starts with the word. You don't, you don't start over here and say, okay, here's what I'm preaching on today. It's a topic. Now let's find all these scripture verses that back it up. They may or may not because they're written in different contexts. Biblical exegesis says. I'm going through a book. We're studying as much as we possibly can. We're getting all our information from that book so that we know exactly what was said, what the Greek words meant in that day and that sort of thing. And I mean, this guy, he's in 184 to 253. I mean, he's a couple hundred years after Christ. And he's saying, we got to know what these words meant 200 years ago. And we got to say <laughs> 2000 years ago, right? Um, so he was very good about a lot of different things um about theology about preaching about spirituality i mean he wrote a lot that had to do with with uh, that the next guy is jerome he was alive from about 347 to about 420 he was a, a christian they called him a priest um he was called a theologian and a historian um he became what um, kind of what people said was a doctor for the church. Um, and it, he's Jerome is best known. The thing he is best known from, he translated the Bible uh, into Latin from Greek to Latin. And they called that version of the Bible, the Vulgate, V-U-L gate. U-L-G-A-T-E. If you've ever heard of the Vulgate before, you know that this is the, the version 
of the Bible that was translated from Greek to Latin, which is what the Catholic Church used for years, even up to our lifetime, really, up in the 50s and 60s, the Catholic Church would read from the from the Latin Bible. Um, and then Augustine. Augustine is probably one of the, the most known uh, early church fathers. He wrote from three, he was alive from 354 to about 430. And uh, he was um, from a place called Hippo. And he's also known as St. Augustine. And he was a very early Christian theologian, philosopher, and probably his writings have influenced Western Christianity more than anybody's, really. I mean, he was very influential. He was very much studied. I had to read his writings when I was in seminary. Um, in fact, I've got a whole section of books at home. But he's he's very, uh, very detailed, very thorough, um, and probably one of the most influential people or one of the most influential church fathers in the, in the past. And these guys were dedicated to Christ. I mean, they wanted to see the church thrive. Um, they they wanted the church to succeed, and they they did what needed to do needed to happen. Any thoughts? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. They um, there were always times of of difficulty in different places and different heresies to deal with, um, because you know as the church grew really fast, and then you have these like the the Council on Nicaea met in, in well, not the Council, yeah. There was a council in Nicaea. There was another council um, early on in 325. So, you know, you're really getting into just right after Augustine, you know, when the church was really getting formed. And and basically what the, and, and they were doing it. I think they were doing things for the right reason, because you have all these churches out here. Right. And you have all these people that are leading them. And at some point, the church has to say, which we do in our denomination, we say, if you want to be qualified to lead, here's the process. You need to go th get this license and then th and get schooling and get this license. And then at some point you get ordained, you know, which doesn't make you a Christian or make you a, a good leader or anything. It just says that we want the people that lead us to have knowledge about scripture. We want them to be trained so that. You know, they, so we just don't have some guy coming in off the street, doesn't know what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? So I think the church at that particular time overall was doing the right thing. They had a lot of these early church fathers who are good godly men. And when things happened like heresies, this would help them to define their theology. But the other thing, and that's a really good question, by the way, Rich. But the other thing that it made them do was it made them say, We've got to come together as a, a structure of churches so that we hold each other accountable. Because the one thing you got to remember is the first 200 years of Christianity, there was no kind of denomination. There was no, I mean, some of the churches wrote to each other. Some of them gave money to each other. If another church was suffering or they had a lot of poor people, like Paul collected money you know, from the Macedonian churches to take uh, to Jerusalem. Um, so that kind of stuff was going on, but there was never any kind of thing that said, here's what we believe. We all need to believe this. All of our church leaders need to report to somebody to keep us on track. I mean, you know how people are. They're the same then as they were today. People don't do what you expect. They do what you inspect, right? They do. And people will get by with what they can get by with. Um, you know, and you got people in key positions. Uh, you know, some of these churches, too, by the way, were were quite large. You know, and back then they started building churches. You know, in the 300s, they start 
like the church in, of the nativity in Jerusalem was built in about 300, the year 300. It's one of the oldest churches in, in uh, well, it's, it is the oldest church anywhere in Israel because when the Ottoman Turks came in and conquered uh, the area of, of Israel, they destroyed all the churches um, because they're Muslim. But when they got to the church of the nativity inside on the upper wall up high, you can walk in there today. They had murals and they had murals of the wise men. This is church of the nativity, right? The wise men visited the Christ child. And the Ottoman Turks are descendants from the wise men, which is was Daniel in the Old Testament. So they let that church stand. So, um, but the first couple hundred years of Christianity, it was every, all these independent churches out there operating. Well, you have all kinds of different things going on. And it, and the church, as the church grew and these church fathers were defining what was heresy, what wasn't, what was scripture, what wasn't. And then they started saying, we've got to have control of our churches. There needs to be an authority. And um, I'm not, I honestly don't understand how the Catholic Church can say we had popes since Peter because the first couple of hundred years, <laughs> there was no organization. You know, who was the pope then? You know? Um, One Catholic Church was called. Yeah. They, I think there was, you know, like Clement was a pope, you know, and I think they, they were, they were on track, um, and they wanted to do the right thing, and the church was getting formed, but then over a period of time, it was like a lot of things, you know, they, scripture wasn't being taught. Some of these churches, like I was going to say a minute ago, some of these churches got quite large. They started building churches, and, uh, um, like if you ever go to Turkey, there's the um, Hagia Sophia is the it's a it's a, a mosque now, but it, it was a church for a thousand eleven hundred years or something. That place is absolutely massive. I mean, massive in size. And uh, they started building all these churches. Well, the the uh, priests, the head priests of those churches were very wealthy. And then there was a period of time where the Pope was also the emperor. And the Pope and the emperor are the two most powerful people in the world. They both control thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Well, at a point when you're, if you're Pope and you're emperor, wow, you, you're, you're, you're the king of the world. And so, and anytime people get elevated to those positions, it almost always goes to corruption. And so a lot of the churches that had, uh, and, and the way it kind of worked was Rome became the most powerful church because it was big. And so everything kind of, Rome was kind of the central of the Roman empire. So the Rome church eventually became the, the greatest power. Um, and so I think back in the, the time period that we're talking about here, they were trying to do the right thing, but eventually then things happened and, Christianity, you know, Satan makes sure it gets watered down. You know, you don't baptize people by marching through the river, right? I mean, you know what I mean? And there's different things that they believe, different. Uh, and as the popes came into play, and one of them believed this, and he spoke at Ex Cathedra, and it came into being. I mean, at some point, they brought in um, purgatory, the belief in purgatory. Um, people could pay to get somebody out of out of hell. That's huge income. There were there was a period of church, and we'll talk about this some more. But there's periods in church where they sold indulgences. Um, there were periods where the, all these churches had something of value. And we talked about this a long time ago, I think, where you, maybe they had a, a piece of wood that came from the cross, and people would come and pay and see it or touch it. Or whatever, you know, um, and it just it got to be about making money and wealth and not so much about loving, loving God. So. Anyway, at first, they, I think they were trying to do the right thing um, by getting organized and forming. And uh, we'll we'll talk about the forming of the canon and stuff next week since we're out of time.
I have a quick question. Sure. Because you think it was a positive thing that uh, Jerome translated the Bible from Greek to Latin? Because I feel like, uh, from my understanding of Pope and the Catholic Church, it was um, the fact that the Bible, the scripture was in Latin, the common people couldn't understand and read scripture. So it was held in power by those in those traditions. Right. And I, that's kind of where things started to. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, I, I think the Bible is good in the common language of people. But what the Catholic Church was trying to do in their leadership at that time, and I think they were doing it for the right reasons, they didn't want people to misinterpret scripture. And so they felt like if we have control of scripture, we read it, they can't read it, then they're not going to take it out of context. They're not going to get it wrong. That the church has the right to be the ones that control scripture and what's taught out of scripture. That makes sense? So yeah. if you if you don't put it in their language, then the church has the power and they take teach scripture correctly. Which I disagree with with that approach because then where's with the Catholic Church, you know, their approach with that because then where's our where do we learn and grow and things like exactly. that. So I feel like that's where from the readings of things that I've done, I feel like almost I didn't know about the translation translation from Greek to Latin when that happened. Um, but that's kind of what stood out to me and I feel like maybe that was the beginning of the end of the Catholic Church and mm -hmm. the demise of Christianity in and of itself. That's, and I think in the long run Yeah, I think in the long run it really hurt them because people need scripture. Right. They need their scripture in their language. They need to and and are they gonna interpret it correctly? Absolutely. And I, that's why I think you need somebody to help teach you scripture to keep you on track. That's why you needed a good theology to keep you on track. Um, and I think they had that, but for whatever reason, they wanted that control. Whether it was that they were doing it for the best of intentions or not, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And the third point is, question going Right. Yep. And they're the, and they're the authority. Yeah. 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 I remember when I first got saved, I got saved in 1981. And for the most part, a lot of people use King James back then, which I absolutely love the King James. I can't stand it um, <laughs> at all. But is it, there's like 1500, there's like 1500 words that are not correct in the King James. The new King James is awesome. The new one. Um, but I remember when the Living Bible came out and it's a paraphrase, so it's not really accurate either. But it's like, finally, I can read it. I don't have to say the the and the thou and what fourth. And, you know, it's like, why wouldn't we want scripture in our language? Greek was the language of the day. I mean, you got to read it in your language and what you can understand. And so um, it was it was wonderful. Now we have just a, an amazing number of versions today um i mean i use the niv but the further i get down the road in my life the more i want to vary a little bit from that because like last week there was uh well, sunday or two sundays ago i even mentioned it from the pulpit uh sometimes the way they interpret things i think there's like um the uh, contemporary english version is a better because all the versions have some qualities versus air, like the ones that are in today's vernacular, a lot like the message, but the message is not as accurate as the NIV, you know, and they get down to one called Young's literal translation. It's like a hundred percent accurate because it's word for word by Greek, but you can't really read it, you know? And so you gotta, I think you can get to heaven reading all of them, even the King James, right? But, but, I mean, like my brother, he like drives me crazy. Uh, like when he prays, oh, Lord, we thank thee for thou gifts, you know, and it's like, what are you praying like that for? You know, and he's got a good heart, you know, but I want to read something and what I, how I talk every day, you know, and and I, I don't, I think if you got to, if it's hard to read something, you're not going to end up doing it probably, you know, so but I, whether that was a good thing or not, 
it definitely kept people from growing because translate it back into the common fund because at that point I would think that the majority of people wanted to be Greek. So um, when it, from Latin was it translated back into the um, of the common people, the language of the common people. Um, but I was thinking that it was in Latin for a pretty long time. Yeah, and then and then the Catholic Church used it, only allowed it in the Latin for a long period of time. Um, I don't know if Whitecliffe did that. Into English well, I was I was thinking about when it was translated to English. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's so many other translations in the world too. Um, it's. In 1535, um, it says uh, A.D. Coverdale's Bible uh, used Tyndale's 1525 version translation along with the Latin and Ger German ver versions and as was done later in English versions. 1537 edition received a license but then was banned in 1546. Um, and then 1536, they ordered Tyndale's version to be burned. Um, I haven't looked into that for quite some time. Um, well, in the science world, I mean, Latin is just Latin. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking when we talk about it says in 1609, uh, A.D. Reams' Douay Bible was the first Catholic English translation. And then in 1611 was the King James authorized version. And people think it was authorized, which means it has more kind of value. It, it means it was authorized because King said he'd pay for it. That's that was he was authorized to because it cost a lot of money to make it. I mean, back in those days, they had that typeset. Every page, every letter had to be set up, and that page had to be printed. And then they changed all the letters to the next page. It takes a long time. Um, but somewhere about around that 1600 mark. But things started to really change too when the printing press became available because then they could get stuff out to normal people, you know? Made a, made a big difference. All right. Sorry I ran over. Try not to make a habit of that. <laughs>